Welcome everyone. Today is September 17th and this is what got our attention. I'm Mike and we have a lot of news to talk about today. PlayStation finally did their announcement and boy do we have things to talk about. I'm, uh, I'm also here with Brian. Yeah, i um, excited to talk about that PlayStation stuff. Uh, there was some good, some bad, uh, but we'll cover it later. In the meantime, it looks like we've got somebody else here. Yeah, we're also here uh, today with Bruno. Hey, everybody, I'm Bruno, and yeah, we've got a whole lot of interesting stuff to talk about with reference to PlayStation and uh, some NVIDIA things come along as well. Awesome. Yeah, and Bruno is going to be uh, one of the new regulars with us, uh, with uh, Mike hosting, of course. So uh, you're going to see a reason. lot more of him around on this. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously, since last week, we, we covered the Dragon Con era, and then this week has been all PAX Online, which has been nine days still going. Uh, so we'll cover mm-hmm. some of that in a little bit of some of the stuff we've already seen and what we've already covered. But uh, I mean, ultimately, it, I'm going to limit myself. <laughs> We're going to try to limit ourselves on these because it is just a lot of yeah. stuff to talk about. But well, you know. it's it's it, it will be shorter than last week's Dragon Con, even though it's a similar topic. I'm going to uh, I'm going to keep myself short on that. Sweet. Well, we'll see what happens, but it's it's still interesting news. There's a lot of good stuff. Obviously, a lot of other uh, news articles we'll touch on today. But uh, before we get into that, we'll do like we always do and uh, what we've been playing. So Tuesday was our game of the moment. As usual, uh, we played a game called Night Squad 2. Uh, if you're not familiar with what Night Squad 2 is, it's actually a demo available. And here we go, plugging PAX. Uh, PAX Online made a partnership with Steam uh, since they, they weren't able to have an in-person convention, which is usually where you meet developers and get to play those early games early or those, those beta state kind of games. They uh, they partnered with Steam to allow them to have like a download demo area. And because of that, we were able to check out a new game called Night Squad 2. And uh, it's a crazy multiplayer game, to say the least. Uh, they both joined me. So Bruno and Brian were there along with some other friends of ours. And it was just chaos. It was just I mean, it was just chaos. Like you literally, there's eight up to eight players. We got to, uh, we could do free for all. So it's kind of like every man for themselves. And we're, it's like a battle royale in a sense of like, everybody's just fighting for each other. There's a bunch of different weapons. So there's swords, there's arrows. There's like this lightning rod that uh, some of you guys really liked. And some didn't, if you didn't, if you're on the receiving end. And uh, it was just really neat. It's, it's a top down perspective game. The map doesn't move around. Uh, You know, what you see is what you get on the map. And you just navigate throughout that. And uh, each of the characters, you know, these small little characters move around. They're all color coded. So uh, you find yourself fairly quickly most of the time. Yeah. Uh, at least don't know about color blindness. That could be an issue there. But it's fast paced. It is built like a local couch yeah. game. But the net code on it's good because every one of us was remote from each other. And it was snappy. It worked well. It was eight players. We had some randos that jumped in at one point because we only had six real players. Uh, If randos don't jump in, bots automatically are set up and you can kind of control some of their difficulty a little bit. And there was literally like one room. Like that was it. Like we were the only room on the East Coast. So like people were jumping in. We're like, yeah, "Ah, let's just play with them because they're here. Why not? (laughs) Yeah, they're they're not going to be able to play anywhere else because like the server browser like had no one else play it because again, it's. A demo right now it's not you know the full release of the game yet and even with it being a demo i mean there was a there was a couple of maps on each type of game that we played right we played uh a, you know very much a, a push pull game very much like the oh, i forgot the name it of it called it's payload, overwatch yeah. it's payload in Night Squad 2. I don't know if it's called the same in Overwatch, but yeah, it's this where you got this cart that you need to move or you got to push this tank from one place to another. It only moves when you're by it. If there's more of the other team, it moves the other direction and you keep fighting to move this thing. And that, that was a nail biting round that we had that just it was it must have been 10 minutes long. It was yeah, I mean, I actually yeah. I made a clip of it on my Twitch. It, it's about nine minutes long. Yeah, the idea is is similar to Overwatch's payload, but the the death comes much quicker for everyone. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. I think the weapons were just really uh, really interesting. They they kind of just developed a very unique set of weapons. I mean, you had your sword, you had your bow, but the the lightning staff and the mage book were very unique, and the boomerang that could go over walls. 
it was just great to watch somebody with that mage staff just electrically destroying somebody and you could just watch that electricity wrap around a wall and murder them yeah well, the thing is, well the thing with that too is seeing the uh seeing the learning curve where people didn't realize that there was much beyond the sword and bow and like one or two other things like they didn't realize there was a bazooka that you could pick up so it was fun watching people like freak out the first time they saw that and we also thought that it was a lot like a lot of the weapons were overpowered and then but you would compare one to another and you're like well the lightning staff is pretty powerful but at the same time the kamikaze would basically just wreck anybody in its path so it was like it, they were all like really done well to where they didn't really overpower another one uh, they were just all unique in its own way so i thought that was pretty neat the other game that though, shield was, and that and shield. The shield yeah the shield and blocking too. Blocking was another aspect just of the, the game. Just, awesome. Yeah, the block shield that just you get by default. You can stop and block and you can stop in certain circumstances, even a bazooka, bazooka blast. Yeah, that was well, really also them kind of forcing the drill to be something that was useful, especially in the payload scenario where you could yeah. break down additional barriers to create an advantage for you to. But it should just camp somebody spawn where you couldn't have done that before. Yeah, that was another thing. The other game that I, I personally liked was Domination which I usually like domination style, like the capture the point kind of thing in different games. And uh, I did really well at that one on this one, but it was it was the same thing. It was a bunch of different points and everybody's running around. So at the same time, everybody had different weapons. So we're all trying to fight for points. And it's just it was really neat. It's a really quick, like you said, couch, almost couch esque game. But it was everybody's online. We're all just kind of enjoying this in the hashtag run economy. Right. Right. Exactly. So. Other than that, I haven't really played anything else. Uh, oh, actually, I have been playing Green Hell. I can't lie. I So I went back to Green Hell. I've been just just making stuff in the forest, and it's just great. And yeah, that's pretty much all I've been playing. <laughs> what about you, Brian? Well, boy, howdy, have I played. Again, between you know all our favorite things that we like to talk about, and this week, and for a couple weeks to come, it looks like that all these demos from all these developers are going to be available. Many, many different game types. So I, I'm not going to go in depth into these. You can, if you just go to, I think it's steampowered.com slash sale slash PAX online or PAX, one or the other, you can just see everything that you can try to download demos for. But uh, Snowtopia, uh, literally ski resort tycoon. It's, uh, in alpha, early alpha. Okay. Uh, so much so that uh, I got it to like bug out at the very end. This was far after it had, had ended and said, oh, you've reached the goals. You can continue playing, but we don't know what it's going to do. And <laughs> sure enough, sure enough, I, I caused it to kind of hard lock. But it's it, it it's a tycoon game and it's That's a cool. blast. And you just set up your ski resort. Um, Enchanted, which reminds me a little bit of like overcooked okay but not quite as frantic or not quite as punishing not necessarily simpler but not as crazy as overcooked is and you're just these little guys uh your your level 0 adventurers you're you're at the adventure academy and uh <laughs> you get roped into like running this in and you have different things you do during the day. It's broken up by phases and different phases. You do different things at night. You decide who's going to do what task that is going to make the end better. And it looks like up to four players at once. It looks both charming. And I played it just by myself with a, you can actually get an AI helper that is minimally efficient. <laughs> and I had a blast. I thought it was great. So check that one out. Uh, Solstra crown of the magister. And I looked at this and I was like, Oh wow, that looks a lot like kind of like divinity, original sin. It looks like yeah. kind of D and D esque. And then I played it and it's not D and D esque. It's D and D. It is the, it's D and D spells. It's D and D classes. It's D and D mechanics. They, it's flat out D and D it's, it's not trying to copy it. They have the license. Oh, nice. so I was okay. actually kind of shocked by that. Cause I was like, we keep hearing about Baldur's Gate 3. Right. And here is this three-quarter perspective, four people in a party, moving around, talking to NPCs, and doing things very much like Divinity Original Sin or even Baldur's Gate, which is coming up. I've never heard of it before. 
And this game is in pre-alpha right now. And you can go out and you can give it a shot and play around with it. It, it looks pretty cool. And the voice acting was halfway decent for it being pre-alpha. So, okay. uh, and it was the demo that they had was pretty featured well. Kiwi, Kiwi I saw at PAX, another charming game. Unfortunately, the single player is not this demo, so I really couldn't play it. I didn't feel like working with somebody online because you had choice of, you know, multiplayer online or multiplayer locally. But you you play a Kiwi and you got this big keyboard that you can jump on the keys (laughs) and you have to transcribe a telegraph to get it off to the next place. And like, so if you have to like shift M one key, we has to go over and jump on the shift key and the other one goes over and sh- jumps on the M key. It's cute. I it don't know what the, what the loop mechanic for playing it is yet, but it's something I want to check out later when I, when I can. Yeah. Trash sailors. It's like raft where me and Mike played raft previously, except way simplified, very specific on the trash you're supposed to pick up at that time to get a certain thing done. And it looks like run based because you're going down this kind of river in the middle of a torn up city, basically, and you pick it up trash and then you get to the end and it like scores stuff. And then you do it again on, on a different run. So it was really weird having this like run based thing that was kind of similar raft, very cartoony looking, looks kind of fun. I had I had fun just as a single player playing it. It definitely is more tuned to having two players play it. Something to give a try. Best for last. This one's on Xbox Game Pass right now. And this is not a demo. This is the full game. And it's called Undermine. And it's a roguelike where you play these peasants that need to go into this mine underneath the town and find out why all these earthquakes are happening. And like any roguelike, there are things that you build up that you collect that make you better next time. And there's things that you collect just on that run that you just, you're not going to see again. Although you can might find blueprints so you can craft them so you can bring them in on your run. And it's, I don't know what was about it. Normally I don't like roguelikes, but this is kind of like a top down dungeon crawler instead of like a 2d platformer. And it just had some neat things that you could do with your characters. And I was watching PAX panels and played like four hours of this straight. And don't even know where the time went. So <laughs> not to mention you took off the whole week just for PAX. Typically you would be there. Oh yeah. But since you I were off this whole week, you would just been just playing all the demos and everything too, which is great. So what about yeah, you? Bruno? Don't expect this every week. <laughs> yeah. What about you? What have you been playing? My, uh, my last seven days have been dedicated to a game that I should have picked up way sooner, but I've been playing Remnant from the Ashes, which is, uh, it's not of the Soul series, but it's a Souls-like game, but with guns. Great, so I hate um, it. <laughs> it's been really great. It's definitely uh, a challenging game, uh, especially when you're uh, <clears throat> too stupid to notice. You can upgrade your armor for the entire first playthrough, <laughs> which is exactly what I did. Oh, so I great. spent the entire game wondering why every boss could one shot me. And people are like, uh, man, this guy's crazy. He's doing all this with no armor. <laughs> that is essentially what oh, ended funny. up happening on stream. When I finally realized halfway through my hard playthrough that I could in fact upgrade my armor and not just my weapons. Um, but it's been really great. A lot of the bosses really well thought out. Um, Gameplay is fantastic, and the challenge is there. So, I'm gonna keep playing that until I get through apocalypse mode, which will be the <laughs> final difficulty. Man, you'll have to do like <laughs> an announcement for stream for that one. Do like a a stream run and just get it done one day, one set, one setting. No way. This That's is the way to happen. I died <laughs> fifty-one times to the Undying King. <laughs> I would be way up, like probably ten times that. So, <laughs> well, that's because you're not the Undying player. Yeah. That's true. Well, uh, let's just let's just get it over with. Let's just get into the news. I mean, there there are. OK, Sony made their announcement yesterday. Four o'clock Eastern. They had it. They uh, had on YouTube, their website, everything. And of course, they announced the price. I'm just going to lead off with that. 
So unlike them. Yeah, unlike them. They they hit at you at the end. Of course, you had to watch all the trailers and stuff. But so first off, release date is 11 12. So November 12th, a few days before Cyberpunk, they're gonna release their new their new uh new uh, console. Also two days before Xbox, so even earlier than Xbox. The prices After. are gonna be four ninety nine for the excuse me, the uh the ultimate uh, PS5, like the one that actually has all of the bells and whistles. And then the digital version is going to be $399. So still $100 more for the, the lesser console. But really all you're losing in this case is the disk drive. Whereas Xbox was saying like they're going to actually like not have as good performance uh, material inside of it rather than, you know, but you'd save on the price, which yeah makes sense. So yeah, it's two days after Xbox. Oh, two days after Xbox. I'm sorry. I thought you said I thought it was two days before. Sorry. I just can't say the 10th is Xbox. Thursday, the 12th is going to be uh, PlayStation. Gotcha. But they uh, so they had obviously their their releases for a bunch of trailers of new games. Uh, The first thing they let off with was Final Fantasy uh, 15 or 16. Final Fantasy 16 announcement trailer. Uh, Very good cinematics. They really didn't show. Well, they didn't really. They couldn't they didn't really tell us if it was gameplay or not. There seemed to be some gameplay aspects to it. Like you could tell that there was actually fighting that the person was actually playing and then a lot of cinematics to get with that as well. Uh, right. So we'll see how that kind of turns out as time goes on. But that was definitely the first flagship that they announced. The uh, The second one was something that we've all been kind of waiting for. But the Spider-Man uh, Miles Morales uh, also came out and they showed that one. That one was actually really interesting because the way that it started off was cinematic. And then it tied right into uh, gameplay, which felt like a movie. And then during the boss fight, like or not the boss fight, the just the action that was going on during the scene, there was a lot of, uh, you know, fighting here and there. But then there was web shooting and swinging off around a bridge and then coming back, hitting a bunch of buttons to kind of save the day uh, along with like, you know, shooting other things. It was just it was really neat the way they did that. And uh, obviously that's going to be super exciting to see on PS5. With. And PS4. And PS4. So that was another They've thing. They've announced that now. Yeah, they initially said at the gameplay release that everything was PS5, and then now little things are coming out, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Mm-hmm. But, so that was another big game. Another game that we had talked about previously on the podcast, which was uh, we talked about rumors, was a new Harry Potter game in the making. And they said like 2021, but they didn't really know. There was nothing really... They knew that Warner Brothers had an agreement, but they didn't really have anything further than that. Well... Wait no more. They actually have a new game. It's called Hogwarts Legacy, and it's not necessarily about Harry Potter because this game actually takes place in the 1800s. So way before uh, Harry and way before Mm -hmm. Dumbledore and everyone. So and the game is based on legacy. So it's the way that the trailer was shown was it looks to be very uh, open world, like in the world of the Harry Potter world. And it's going to be a lot of different things going on. Like you're kind of almost related to like the the mobile app they have. There's a mobile app, Harry Potter game that you can play where you take classes and you kind of learn how to become like a wizard and such. Uh, So similar to that. But the other part of it is that there is the, you know, you're kind of shaping the future. So what that means, like, is that going to be, they're going to introduce like Voldemort? Can you go to the dark arts? Can you do, you know, can you not like, any? I, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to take that, but uh, they definitely have that out there. So that's it's something to look forward to. Now they also showed final fantasy 16, uh, which has long been rumored. And they were very, very careful to say console exclusive because in very small letters down at the bottom, they said coming to PC too. Yeah. Uh, that should be interesting. It looked good. It was definitely final fantasy. The combat, it was hard to tell how the combat's going to be worked, whether it's kind of similar to how like final fantasy seven has been doing it recently. The more actiony combat. That's what it looked uh, like. Yeah. Strategic. Yeah. It should be interesting to see what that's going to be. Another one that, that showed up was death loop which they right. called a console exclusive, but it's it's not. It is a timed console exclusive. It will be coming to the Xbox. It's just going to be very similar how Xbox locked up Tomb Raider back in the past, where it was like a year before it came to PlayStation. This will in be very Lands similar. Three with Epic and things. It's same same similar thing. Yeah. So it, we don't know how long it's going to be, but Deathloop, which some people are excited about, I'm kind of like, eh. But that's one another timed exclusive that's going to be showing up. Yeah. The other one that I saw was Resident Evil Village was announced. 
Uh, I'm not a huge fan of scary games, but it did look to be a scary uh, type, like first person game. Uh, I don't know how they're going to handle that. Like, I don't really know what the story is based on the trailer, but it definitely looks scary and it's definitely been announced. The other big thing they, they talked about, there was a couple other games they mentioned after this point where like, a, uh, Odyssey, odds, odd, uh, Abe's Odyssey kind of like remake games coming back out. They talked about uh, another five Imagine Nights at Freddy's. Like it, it was just a lot of things that I didn't expect to see out of God of War, Ragnarok. Right. Well, that's how they yes. ended it. Yeah. So that was actually exciting. They said like one last thing, and then they showed this little really bit teaser, and it was like Ragnarok, and it's like yeah. yeah. So very excited about that. I platinumed the first game like in a weekend. It was. <laughs> A terrible experience for Savannah because she just watched me stick to a TV for 60 hours in 72 hour period. That, but it was worth it. <laughs> I can I can believe that from you. The uh, the other thing. So with all the other games they announced, like the Abe's Odyssey, the remaking of five, five Nights of Freddy. Oh, they also announced another Call of Duty. So uh, uh, Cold War, which, you know, looks like another Call of Duty. I mean, I don't I don't know. I'm kind of over it at this point. Uh, but the, you know, it's the new Madden. So it's, that's what it is. But, uh, the other thing they announced was they started showing a bunch of games from PlayStation four and it was showing like all these games, games, games. And they showed the PlayStation plus logo and they were like coming to PlayStation plus. So everybody started thinking like, wow. Yeah. Well, it was very confusing because everybody started going, wow, this is the new game pass. They're announcing it. And then shortly after this happened, a, uh, a, a, our article was came out that basically said that the PlayStation five, they have Sony has suggested there or has said there is no, no way they're going to produce a game pass style uh, pass for the PlayStation five. So the PlayStation plus that we saw was all previous games, PlayStation four games. They're not going to bring anything PlayStation five to it. And they don't expect to do that either. So, once again, it's like the things that we were thinking that maybe they were going to take a step in the right direction and that in the sense of like game sharing doesn't seem like that's going to happen. So, yeah, and it was it was a very ambiguous thing. Like there was no clarity on what that was in the stream for of what it was for. Uh, obviously, since other people are like afterwards going, uh, OK, so are you bring in Game Pass type thing and no. So they had, there were a couple of confusing things in that particular stream and well, I don't like, know. they, they still brought the games. They brought the games, which is something that Xbox and Microsoft has been having problems with, with conveying to people. And the games may not be all exciting to us, but certainly this was a, like, for instance, they also showed, um, dark souls remake. Oh, and how did I forget that? Souls souls. How did you, for, because it was forgettable to you. It was just forgettable. It wasn't forgettable to me. It was the first part of that. The very first three seconds were like amazing because I'm a huge Souls fan. And then the following 10 seconds of walking with one shotting were really, really troubling to me. And then the boss montage just brought me back in. But uh, it was definitely a weird trailer. And then they, of course, right. had to retract parts of it. Because that trailer actually did indicate that it was going to release on PC. Um, and they had to walk that back. They were like, that was a mistake. It is not coming out on PC. Um, <laughs> that was just a mislabel. Uh, so it's not a thing. Technically, it's already out on PC. <laughs> yeah, well. So well. at the end of the whole release, they, you know, they flash the price. They show the two consoles. And really, the only difference in the price uh, in the consoles in this case is one's digital and one's not. One has a disk drive, one doesn't. And in the amount, I think, the terabyte of space you get with the, the actual console. And that was it. And then they said, as far as pre-orders, I believe it just said, like, you know, you'll find out soon kind of thing, like opening soon. About the price, I think that's interesting, too, because it's $100 less. And pretty much the only difference, according to them, is that it doesn't have the Blu-ray drive, which... Seems odd that it's only $100 at that point. Why wouldn't it be just be like $50? Because these things are not that expensive to make in quantity anymore. Yeah. Whereas, whereas the Xbox says, hey, we have two different power levels. And the lower power level is going to be more powerful than the previous generation. And it's going to run pretty darn good still and have ray tracing. So it's still a step up for you. And it's like $200 cheaper. 
Yeah. So instead of 500, it's $300. And then that makes sense to me. It's like, oh yeah, it's, it's, it's not just the disc drive. It's a disc drive. It's a smaller disc. It's, it's less powerful, but still a step up. And, and at the insanely low price of $300. So I, I, I think, I even think their pricing is a little confusing on theirs. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I see the digital side of it. Like, you know, I don't, I don't have DVDs. I don't have CDs anymore. Right. Like it's all digital. I would probably prefer the digital drive, but I mean, but if that's the only difference, then yeah, why wouldn't I go digital? But I don't know. That is, that is very odd. And then yeah. I think, you, I think you had some information, Bruno, on the, the pre-orders. Yeah. So, uh, the pre-orders ended up, uh, going not so good. Um, it was intended for the pre-orders essentially to launch on uh, 970. Um, not that that was super well clarified throughout um, the stream, but uh, that that was the designated launch for pre-orders. However, the retailers that they were working with uh, did not agree with their pre-order start time. Um, and I think uh, Walmart actually took the lead on releasing pre-orders first. Um, far before anybody understood they were going to come out um, and before the time that Sony has, had anticipated them to come out, which, you know, with, with pre-orders like this and, you know, with a, with a new console release, even just a couple of hours difference makes a lot of people yeah. very angry. I mean, I know um, pre- personally people that are It's the difference between somebody getting the console or not getting the console. Um so there was there was a miscommunication there, or just a lack of wherewithal to listen to the actual release time for the pre-orders, and several different retailers, Walmart, GameStop, Best Buy, um, Amazon, they all just kind of kicked it off early, allowing um, a lot of people to get in on those pre-orders before others even knew it was live. So some people would come back at midnight, anticipating that the pre-orders might be up, only to find that the pre-orders had already been up for hours. They were well behind the ability to purchase the console, uh, which left to a lot of outrage scrambling to figure out how they were going to get their hands on the console that they were waiting for. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was interesting, too, because Microsoft kind of jumped in on it. They were a little cheeky because they were like, <laughs> hey, don't worry, we're, we're going to let you know when pre-orders come up. Yeah. You know, we're, 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 we're not going to mess with. And it wasn't even Sony's fault, but I mean. Yeah, but Microsoft's still, kind of capitalizing. They're gonna on just it. they're gonna stab at it if they can. It's so funny. Yeah, I mean it makes sense. I mean Sony has certainly stabbed at them at a couple of things. It, I mean that's that's how the business works. Uh, yeah, I thought it was hilarious because you know the pre-orders were supposed to go up today, and and all these now they're all sold out everywhere. Yeah, and not yeah. to mention the scalpers, the people who were trying to resell it just for overpriced. So now when you thought you had a chance. You know, there's not even that chance anymore. And even that, I think, ugh, I don't know, there's even more news than that. So, yeah, luckily for some, the retailers did pull back a little bit um, part of the way through. So some people were able to pick some of the consoles up at the correct time, um, ranging from anywhere after 12 through to three in the morning. Um, people were still able to get their hands on some, but it was much more scarce at that point, kind of in waves and um, I mean, GameStop's website just straight up was advising people that they were blocked from from purchasing. It was just like a very a blunt purchase error, just saying you are blocked from this website. Um, so it was very very weird the way that a lot of the they a lot of the ways that they presented it. They weren't prepared for anything that happened. They kind of just pulled the trigger sooner than they should have. It almost sounds like Sony gave them the slap on the wrist, and then they retracted what they did and then they came back at the correct time, but the damage was already done because the majority of their consoles were well gone. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Microsoft took the opportunity to take a shot and it works really well. So long as they actually uphold their side of it and there's no funny business with their, uh, their pre-orders going forward. Well, but even with that, there's already been speculation on production cuts for PlayStation five. Like they've already had this rumor going around. So that's correct. Yeah, there has there has been speculation essentially that there was supposed to be 15 million units for production, and that they cut back four million units. Um, now that's that's already a problem in terms of just the amount of the units that they intended to release in the first place, and how many that are going to be available in general. Um, but to kind of add confusion to it, uh, PlayStation themselves came out and officially stated that um, 
they did not cut back 4 million units of production. They didn't state whether the correct number was 15 million or 11 million. They just said they didn't count back on 4 million. So nobody actually knows if it's going to be 15 million produced units or 11 million because they're obviously not going, somebody's not going to tell us one way or another. Gonna yeah, it's a little weird too today. because the original report uh, from what I saw was a Bloomberg report, which means the source was likely a shareholder meeting somewhere. Yeah. Which means that this isn't like, this isn't the rumor guys that are talking to devs and finding out stuff. This is actual company statistics being sent out and having 15 million down to 11 million. That's a 27% decrease. That's significant. And, you know, compared to the PlayStation four, PlayStation four in a six month time frame sold 7.5 million units. And this, this 11 and 15 million now is supposed to be within a, about a six month time frame is what they're talking about. You know, the launch window as it were, and to sell 7.5 million units, that means you have to produce about 10 million. Well, 10 million, 11 million is not all that different at this point. Yeah. And for them to reduce production, because the other thing is production was reduced supposedly because of problems producing the chips, that they were having production errors. And that's why they scaled this back. This, this is why this all sounded like some type of shareholder meeting. And if they're going to scale it down to 11 million, that means they're going to produce about the same amount that they produced for the PS4. Well, PS4 was pretty short on release. It was hard to locate them. And I'm pretty sure the demand is much higher now than it was then. So I think we might have this scarce. Even if we don't have a natural scarcity, you're going to have the scalpers that see this and the scalpers are going to buy it and jack up the prices on everybody. So we're going to have what looks like an actual shortage on these things. Well, and the thing is, they actually came out and said that, but we're not going to have any less than the PlayStation 4 release. Like, we're going to have at least the same amount. But like you said, I mean, with scalpers and being the scarcity, being that scare of like, oh God, am I going to be able to get one? Like that, I mean, look at, yeah, look at, look at the switch. I mean, the switch was sold and Nintendo does this all the time. They always sell like a third of what they actually want to sell because they know people are going to want it. And even with this, I mean, we're going to see that happening and it's going to be, you know, how, how bad do you really want to pay for one? Cause I'm not going to pay double price. Like some people probably will. Oh yeah. I'll refuse to pay anything above the MSRP on, on a console or or anything. Really? I'm not going to pay a scalper for it. I really suspect that this is going to be a problematic launch. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, when we think about the Xbox versus PlayStation announcement, uh, like we talked about it recently, actually, some us and some friends who were saying, you know, the console wars are really over. Like they're, they're really at this right. point, all the consoles are pretty much on the same specs. Like there's nothing more technologically advanced than the other. So it's really about what you know what the the exclusivity the, the games are going to be bringing mm-hmm. that they have which in this case playstation showed those and really oh, won yeah. won that part of the the war i guess you could say absolutely but Battle. ultimately everything else like i feel like microsoft really just just nailed it this year they they really took the focus off of just the console made the game pass made the the partnership with epic to get their ea to get the uh, ea games on there and now it's it's really a battle of like we what we've been saying really is, you know, get an Xbox pass. If you have a PC, get the Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and then just buy a PlayStation 5 if you're looking to get those those uh, exclusive games right away. If not, you can just wait because a lot of these are coming to PC anyway. Yeah, they, they yeah. even said that during the, in small letters. Yeah. They even said that during the Sony announcement. So. Yeah, part of the end of that console war definitely comes from the fact that Xbox is becoming more and more of a service than a console. When Mm -hmm. people think Xbox, they think mostly Xbox Game Pass, the ability to get access to those brand new games at the low cost of like, you know, a small subscription a month. So it's it's kind of hard to compete with that in terms of it's, you know, it's like you're competing an actual piece of hardware and some exclusives versus a service that exists across multiple platforms and um, is pushing towards allowing you to experience crossplay with people that might not have the budget to get into the world yeah. which which playstation has made the, made it very clear they're not going to do that so they will yeah. not it costs too much money according apparently to them yeah well changing subjects completely 
as Mike mentioned earlier, I have been attending PAX online. Mike Slacker. has seen it uh, as well. <laughs> uh, I don't know if Bruno's uh, visited a little bit or not, but uh, I want to keep this much shorter than our Dragon Con coverage, but I want to cover some of the same points. So I'm going to like whip through these bullet fast. Mike will probably jump in and comment on a couple of them as I go through. Uh, but PAX Online, to start off with, was a combination of PAX West and PAX Australia, as I had said previously. But what I didn't know is that it also included in the EGX, uh, which used uh, used to be called the Euro Game Show. And it's, it's kind of a game show that bounces between Germany and the UK every year. And so, like the rest of these, they had to go online and they just partnered up with Read Pop and PAX and made this a combined show. So it made it really easy to do 24 hour programming. They got start off with accessibility. When we spoke about accessibility last week, we're mostly talking about how easy it is to find something, but it's also accessibility for those that don't have the same abilities that we do, especially the hearing impaired is a very important one with online like this. First off, if you went to PAX Online, the main site right across the top told you everything, told you the schedule, it told you where the streams were. It was very easy to find the streams. There were three Twitch streams, so they used pretty much the biggest video service, yeah. Twitch. They also had a YouTube stream as well. All of them had chat. They were watching the chat for uh, asking questions because many of these panels were live, not all of them. But even the ones that were pre-recorded, the people that recorded them showed up in the Discord because on top of the chats, they had an entire Discord server set up for it. And that Discord a, server was on fire. <laughs> Good way. And was, it was insane. It was amazeballs. They had so many different things to do, so many different places that you could be and join up with people that are doing the same thing. It wasn't just about the panels and streams that was going on. It was about everything packs, but for the streams, the P even a pre-recorded stream, the people would show up and show up in the discord and talk to the people and answer their questions. I don't think there was a single panel that didn't have someone talking to the attendees, which was amazing. That was one of the things that we said was important. And they had partnered with, I don't remember the website now, but there's a specific website for captioning and it, it's an AI that captures it captions real time. Oh, is so that what that real... was at the bottom? Like the, I saw that on a couple of streams, like the opening one, I was like, oh, some of it was good and some of it was ones. a little off. Oh man, it was funny. The first ones were amazing. They were so bad, but it learned it. You could see it learning and it, it eventually it stopped saying P A C S every time someone said PAX. Yeah. and put PAX. So for accessibility, it was a win. For attendance and viewership, it's been a win. The main channel almost consistently had about 1,500 people all the way up to two and 3,000 people yep. for the first three days consistently throughout the entire day of US mm -hmm. Day. I mean, even the 15-minute blocks in between panels there was 1,500 people there. Yeah, it was I mean, constant. Ultimately, during the week, what I've noticed is it obviously fell off because during the week, it's it's oh, harder yeah. for people who were obviously working still that didn't take off a full week to just enjoy an online convention. <laughs> but, uh, but even during the week, but even during the week, it was still like 300 people. And that's per channel. And there's three yeah. channels going on. So they're con constantly throughout the entire day. They got 900 people watching this at any given moment. It's not a huge number streaming wise, yeah. but they're not making their money off the streaming. They're making their money off of a lot of the merch and a lot of their merch got tied in to some of the stuff that was in the discord. You didn't have to pay for anything in the discord. That's not what I mean, but they had games in the discord. They had things you could do. You could collect. Uh, there's a common thing at the convention called PAX XP where you go around the real world convention and you like scan stuff or, or you swipe your badge at, uh, the readers and you get points for doing different things. And you build this story and they built it into the discord. They actually had in the tabletop section that you looked around and a bot talked to you. Cause uh, this was all bot run in discord yeah. and it did a little tiny little adventure with you. 
That was really and, cool, by the way. Yeah, I definitely checked it oh, out. Oh, you actually did cool. it? Yeah, I did. It was super cool. Hey, you roll a six-sided die, and it, you, you had to do it several times in order to do the last part just right so that you could earn an emote, because you earned these emotes. You collected them as you went along, oh, doing wait. all these different things. So there was actually different outcomes? Yeah. If oh. you, as you rolled different die, each of the different times, it was a six-sided die, so they had six different sets of text for each of the different steps as you went through. Oh, and you wow. had to get a perfect critical hit on the last one in order to either earn the bow or the sword emoticon, depending on which one you chose. Yeah, I so definitely even, beat it first yeah. try. It was like, yeah, type in your name to get this little like icon of an old guy. And I was like, okay, cool. I have an emotion now, like with my my thing. It was oh, yeah, really... that's, just, that's just the old guy one. Because oh, you that's still cool. get you have to you have to do a critical hit to get the sword and the bow. So you can still oh, keep doing it. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, I mean, that was so really they, neat. It was like a, a text-based adventure, essentially. Like a bot would talk yeah. to you. you would, it would tell you a story. You would say, roll the die. It would roll the dice. And then it, depending on the outcome, it would give you the next scenario. Really neat. Really, right. really cool idea for a Discord. Way to yeah. like, capture like people. And they had some trivia games going on. And they even had a line simulator that, that <laughs> believe it or not, I saw that. actually captured some of the feeling of being in the line, of talking to people around you. And the ball bot would come out and throw the ball. And if it, you'd say play game, you know, to the bot to play the game. And he'd, if it descended on you, you'd ever either have to hit the ball or dive, kick the ball or, uh, kick the ball. And you had to type the right one. Otherwise it stopped. <laughs> but if you did it, you earned the ball emo uh, emoji. So I just, they had all these different pieces of interactivity just in the discord server. So that was a win because that's kind of filler content and also filler content. The stuff in between their panels was all recorded for this. All of it was new. It like some of it was video recording people that had been at previous packs and, and been involved in panels. Some of it was talking about some of the games that are coming out. Some of it was pointing you to different places. So like this is where you can find these things. So it helped you with that accessibility again. So all the filler content was useful and there was a great variety of it too so you didn't see it repeat too often yeah. so that was cool panels and guests just the very first keynote panel which i was kind of disappointed only what half an hour usually goes an hour but it was the gentleman who originally made cyberpunk 2077 uh mike pondsmith i believe is his yep. name and and then later on in the day, his son GM'd a tabletop Cyberpunk 2077 game with some panelists. Uh, but I've also seen like earlier today, I watched almost the entire voice cast of Overwatch. Not the, that's Overwatch is getting big with his voice cast. Uh, but I mean, there was 12 different voice actors there that were talking about voice acting in Overwatch. And I'm seeing these people from different parts of the industry, whether it's gaming or acting or it, this is a gaming centric convention. So it's typically related to gaming somehow like yeah. the overwatch one was, but the panels have been really great and we're not even done with the week yet. So lots of great guests, lots of great panels. It looks like they spent the money there and brought these people in and typically the panelists uh, have to pay to become part of it. So that's part of where they're making some of their money, like loading, ready run had their panels and they brought stuff in. Gotcha. Uh, content specific to this. Uh, yeah, a lot of it was, there was some specific to, you know, packs being online. The discord was the, that main content. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's was something that just has never happened in the packs before. And it was evident that they spent a lot of time and they spent money and went out and got developers to create these bots that did all these different things there that interacted with you. Uh, live performances. Well, I mean, they've had them now. It's not like the concerts at PAX, which typically are starting at like 10 o'clock at night and running till like two or three in the morning. And it's just band after band, like the double clicks come up and MC front a lot. You know, you get all these, bands and performers that either are gaming related or tangentially gaming related or just nerdcore. Uh, 
there was a uh, one concert that I threw Mike's way that Mike already knew who they were. Yeah, Triforce Quartet was amazing. If you haven't seen them, they actually come to Dragon Con as well. Uh, I saw them a couple of years ago when they were here. And actually, what was funny is they were we went to it was time to take a break. We were like, we need to sit down. It's late. Like we need one last break before our last hurrah kind of thing. And there was like almost like a podcast scenario kind of set up in one of the rooms. And we went in and they uh, it was kind of actually rude because they were taking a break and the band was in the like, the quartet was in the back. And they're like, while we're taking our break, they're going to perform. And so people had kind of rolled in to kind of watch them. But some people were there already for the podcast. But the podcast people were just talking the whole time over their quartet. So finally, where I just like looked at him and like said something because I'm like, like, these guys are trying to play music. Like, what are you doing? You know, like, it's so yeah. rude. But anyway, besides that, but anyway, the Triforce Corset, they they uh, they and play that was a lot. Dragon Con. This was a Dragon Con. Yeah. So yeah. they play a lot of different uh, like medleys together that they do. Of, obviously, of Zelda, they do Mega Man. They've done even uh, I don't know if they did Undertale, but I know they did Shovel Knight and they just do a really, really good job. And for me to see them on, at PAX live, they were and it was actually really neat. They were all sitting in the same room, uh, obviously somewhere they're probably going to somebody's house or something. And uh, they're all wearing masks, masks all wearing and, masks. And like the masks were like the one guy had like some spots on his shirt. His mask had spots. One guy had yeah. a gray shirt. His mask was gray. One guy was all black, had a black mask. And the other guy was all white. He had a, he had a black mask as well. But it was kind of cool how it was color coordinated. Yeah, coordinate. and I, I love that because it was really them just making a statement. Like, obviously, they were all in the same room, and it was just probably them. They probably play together all the time. But it was really that statement of just saying, like, you know, we're all here doing this because of the situation out there, and this is what we have to do. And they they yeah. killed it. They played everything just like they usually do. I've actually got their, their CD, and we've got a shirt and everything before. But uh, they did a really good job. But the best part about it, as we said before, is they had, like, 1,200 people watching them. They were literally on the PAX channel playing for like 1200 people. And like yeah. when I watched them, there was like five people in the room that were paying attention. So that was really cool to see. And uh, definitely one of the like the best guests or one of the best performances that I've seen at like a local con kind of thing. But uh, but yeah, that was really neat. It was just seeing that kind of stuff was really cool. They actually brought in like a guitar player and a saxophone player uh, that they had somewhere else remotely. It was really neat. So anyway, I like them. Check them out. <laughs> Yeah, and there was other performers as well. Again, not as many as what I expect to see at a live PAX, but still, uh, they had some. I saw these, I think it might have been 88-bit, but I'm not sure. No, it was Consol, C-O-N-S-O-U-L, Consol. Okay. And they were really interesting because they did like this kind of jazz riff off of a lot of the game music that we're used to hearing. And again, all of this was super easy to find because if you went to the main site and you clicked on features in features, it showed you the streams. It talked about the discord. So the discord was easy to find the exhibitors. So it had like an expo hall type that you could see. And, and that's where they made some of their money is because these developers pay to have a place in the expo hall so that you uh, have awareness of them. They had PAX arena, which is their esports, what playable games they had, because not only do they have the demos, but I think it's Voodoo Ranger Beer set it up with uh, Wizards of the Coast and has every day there are like 15, 20, 30 D&D games going on every single day that you can just pop in and play D&D for like an hour and a half, two hours, and then move on with your life. Um, they, you know, of course, have their merch link. Very easy to find. The Omegathon, which is six uh, lucky people got chosen. To, yeah, you like, were talking play. about that last night. Yeah, because it's going on right now. I'm, I'll have to go back and watch it because the next round. But they they compete against each other, and it's you watch them compete, and they don't. They only know about some of the games in advance, so they can practice them a little bit. But whoever does the best overall at the end, they play an unknown game every year. It's unknown, and it's the final closing part of PAX, and then whoever wins that unknown game, and it's been a whole bunch of different things. Like I think. Last PAX, it was a virtual reality version of Space Team, but it doesn't have to be. I've seen them play Battleship, real, live, not video game, That's board awesome. game, Battleship. They had a claw game once, literally the, the stand up claw game. And, you know, but they whoever wins that, they get an basically an all expenses trip paid trip to 
any PACs that they want to go, which really for the people in the U S means PACs Australia. But back to the performances again, under this features page, which is makes all this stuff super easy to find. They've got performances. They've got, of course, the child's play charity. Uh, you can earn a cookie emoji by donating and people giving the cookie brigade gives you a cookie in the discord. Uh, the AFK room, which is pretty awesome. They, they talk a lot about uh, mental health and taking a break. Uh, game, again, game events, tournaments, literal tournaments. Uh, I don't think Mike was able to join, uh, yeah, one of the six or so. the rocket league tournament was like 2 AM because it's on Australia. Well, time. One of them. I was like, there's no way there's others. Well, there were, the other ones were for more of the actual, actual esport people who do play professionally. And I was like, the yeah. one that I could join was 2 AM. I was like, I'm just not going to do that. Not going to come do on, that. Mike, you got this. Yeah. yeah. Not at 2 AM. I was like, <laughs> even talking to the, the other friend, do flunky PC, who was going to be on our team to play. And uh, he was like, yeah, man, I don't know if I could like, even without like drinking that night. Like, I don't know if I would be able to be like even somewhat functional to play this game at 2 a.m. Like, it's not even going to happen. But yeah. unfortunate, we'll, we'll have to do our stardom to Rocket League fame uh, another day. <laughs> and the last couple of things on the features page was the indie showcase, which they showcase a lot of indie developers and PAX Rising, which is they showcase a specific set of amazing indie developers. So they really uh, are are very indie developer friendly for this conference. Yeah. So, so again, back to the accessibility, it was so easy to find anything you wanted to do. It really even was. Even if it was just getting together and playing some games with someone, video games or board games or whatever. Overall impression, this, there were mistakes, there were problems. The, you know, there were some disappointments like uh, not as many live performances and the Keystone being half as long as I kind of expected it normally to be a couple of things like that. But overall, this. I will say, well, disclaimer, I mean, we I, I, I was probably pretty harsh on the Dragon Con thing last week, but we have to be we have to be familiar with what PAX is. PAX has been doing this for like 10 years or more. Right. Like online, and this is all gaming. So they're very familiar with the, the space that they they are u- to use to you know broadcast their audience. So having a Twitch channel, having YouTube, having all these really neat things like the niche things like you know Discord and all that. This was not new to them. So you know the things they added to it, yeah, it was definitely new. So overall, don't get me wrong. Like when we say this or when I say this, like obviously PAX won, but it, it's really not a competition in that sense. Like there's a lot of things that. Dragon Con could like learn from this, like Comic Con could learn from this. But as you were well, saying, yeah, there's other things it, that could still be worked out. But with that, I mean, Dragon Con's been doing it longer. PAX has been doing it for 16 years, 2004. Yeah. Uh, Dragon Con's been doing it since, I think, 1989. Yeah, it's like 89. And, and if you look at it, they should be able to be good at the things that they have been doing. Now, the only advantage really that I saw that PAX had was that PAX has been streaming their stuff on Twitch yeah. forever. So they didn't have to figure out the streaming. Right. They, part. they understood the, the internet sense, like the space that they had to use for the, the streaming. So, but they did have to figure out how to get the people together to stream because that is different because before yep. they had a paid place, just like dragon con did that people came together and sat in a ballroom at a hotel and streamed. So, they had to learn that part, but they put so much more effort in all the other aspects of the online thing that it just blew it out of the water. This is how you do an online convention. Yeah. Which and brings me to, well, go ahead. we'll say, and by the way, this is still happening. Like we still have a yeah. few more days of packs online. So when you, by the time you're listening to this, it's still happening and go check it out. It's really neat. Like there's something you can find uh, on some part of the day. So, Tomorrow night, Friday night, is Acquisitions Incorporated, which is the D&D, the Wizards of the Coast, D&D sponsored D&D event, which includes the creators of Penny Arcade, along with some other people. I think uh, I think Morgan Webb might be back as Morgane. Patrick I know you're Rothfuss a big fan of that. Maybe back. Oh, yeah, it's it's they they put on an amazing show. It's like two and a half hours long, and it's just so fun to watch. But that's the overall impression. What can they learn to do better next year? It's. And why don't I have this link? It's actually interesting <laughs> that. Um, it's actually interesting to, to bring that up because 
I saw an interview with Jerry Holkins, one of the creators of Penny Arcade, and Ryan Ryan Hartman, I think, who is the Penny Arcade slash Reed Pop person who puts together the convention. And he said, this year was so different. He goes, I was at the point after doing this for enough years that I could put a convention together in my sleep. But this was totally different with it being online. There were so many new things to solve. And it, it was really exciting for him to be able to have that challenge. And he said it was the seat of his pants. And it's a totally different feeling of what I had to do when and, and my job changed dramatically. And he said that some of the things that he learned that he wanted to carry forward was definitely the Discord. They they thought it was yeah. an amazing success. They want to bring that forward. That was the main thing he talked about. But he wants to bring forward a couple of the other things that they learned too. Some of it was logistics space, but some of it is going to be like performance based too. Of like, I'm. It might be really interesting to see a physical convention that also has like maybe this panel's online only because the people can't make it into the United States because of a pandemic or because of political reasons or because of, you know, what have you yeah. just financial reasons even, but it would be great to like, I don't know. Uh, CD project red is probably not the best one to pick because they actually have a pretty good budget. <laughs> yeah. But if you had a small Polish uh, developer and publisher that, you know, wanted to talk about their stuff and wanted to have a panel, well, They've solved some of those problems, not perfectly, but they've solved some of those problems. So this is stuff that not only do I think that they can do better next year by continuing these things forward, like I've said on all of these conventions so far, is they need to continue forward some of these online things they're doing, but that they will actually do them better as well, that they've learned from their mistakes and and they got whole new mistakes they're going to make too. That's fine. And there's always going to be technical difficulties that we can't do anything about. Right. But it really looks like they're going to be able to carry this forward. And they they themselves literally in an interview have said they're already thinking about how to carry it forward. So that's exciting. That is exciting. You know, it also is exciting. I think the next segment is exciting. <laughs> what is that's the next because, segment, Brian? That's because the next segment is our favorite reoccurring weekly segment Mike cyberpunk 2077 weekly update so this week i can actually say we don't really have much or i don't really have much because there hasn't really been any announcements yet but yet yet is the key word so tomorrow is their scheduled night city wire stream that they're scheduling and it's going to happen at 9 or 12 Eastern time. So 9 p.m. Uh, Pacific. But they're going to go over all of the different things that they've been doing. Uh, basically, the tweet that came out uh, was we have a small change in lineup. We won't be talking about Cyberpunk 2077 music just yet, which they kind of already talked about the artist in the game music. I don't know. Uh, we will, however, have some cool news that many of you request or should we say require. Uh, nothing else hey, changes. Here. See you guys tomorrow on, you know, 6 p.m. on their time at the at their Twitch. So obviously the, tomorrow, big news. Well, we'll yeah, see. the music that they were going to talk about this time was the scoring. Right. The, the actual track. Yeah. Not just the the bands. So um, but it's interesting. A, I don't know what they mean. That's a teaser. Well, that's the thing. It's like interesting. It's almost like they listen to our podcast and they're like, oh, they have a cyberpunk segment. They need they need news. So we're going to do this to so they can have something, even though they're a day late. So I need I need so, cyberpunk uh, to step it up and like make the it a day late. The require is that they're going to list um, updated requirements for the actual game. Oh, that's so, a good yeah, point. That's right. Yeah, that's a yeah, good point. They're going to detail exactly what the minimum requirements and the recommended requirements to run it at, at different settings will be. Yeah, sure. That's a good point. Well, they, we've already seen it running on 3080. Like we already see what that looks yeah. like. So, yeah, that's exciting. Actually, so the other thing that we do have for the Cyberpunk update is that on PlayStation, they've actually already um, released the Platinum Trophy uh, for the game. So we know what that looks like. And we know that uh, it also revealed that the game has just one gold trophy along with 17 silver and 26 bronze. So that is that is the Cyberpunk update of the week. And hopefully by next week, we'll have a lot more information. And they they already 
not just released information about the Platinum Trophy. They already achieved the Platinum Trophy in the QA department. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But so yeah, they've 100 awesome. percented the game, which is kind of their job in QA anyway. I would but, hope so. Know. If it was like 98, I'd be like, eh, well, you know, <laughs> so this is like a normal another developer that we know. No. <laughs> so anyway, with that being said, um, we we appreciate you guys sticking around. Give us just a few minutes here. This is just uh, check out our word from our sponsors. So take care. And we're back like usual. We're still here we, we actually haven't gone anywhere. I don't know what the ad may have said, but we're still here. We're, we're alive. We're still kicking. Uh, at least I, as far as I know, we're still kicking. Hopefully all of you guys are still with me. <laughs> uh, I died during the break. Yeah, pretty much. So the, the first thing I want to lead off with, and this is a game that I'm very passionate about. I would say passionate I, only because I've only played like almost a thousand something hours of this game, but uh, Rocket League doesn't did announce they were going free to play. We talked about that before. We actually had uh, Nito on on the stream to talk about what her thoughts on that were. Uh, well, the day is finally here. And it, initially, it was just they're going free to play in the summer, and then the summer came and went, and we're like, when are they going free to play? We still don't know. And then actually, Nintendo, I'm I'm pretty sure it was Nintendo that dropped the leak date. So on their their store, they had updated the Rocket League page, and they were like, yeah, coming free on the 23rd. And we were like, what? And I was like, I mean, I actually saw this. Nito posted this on Twitter, and that's how I saw it. So because of that, they've actually announced they are going free to play on the 23rd. And uh, if you're not familiar, what that means is uh, they are actually going to Epic. Epic is going to be hosting them now uh, as free to play. Uh, with that, if you, you know, don't freak out. If you're owning on Steam currently, you're still going to have the game. The only difference is on Steam is you're going to have to log in with your Epic account to be able to play Rocket League. So you can still launch it from Steam, but you have to log in with your Epic credentials to do that. The other issues or other things that may come up with that too is as of today, if uh, you haven't bought Rocket League on Steam, you're not able to anymore. That's completely gone. And uh, and after the 23rd, you're not gonna be able to like buy it at all. Like it's just gone. Or I think it's today actually. It's already gone. So uh, you do sign in through Epic. The the good news is they also pushed an update with this. It wasn't just hey, we're going to be available only on Epic. It's also the update they pushed out. So they kind of almost did a huge rehaul. They they completely redid the intro. The intro now contains, uh, for the first time, a uh, tutorial, a light tutorial, where there was a tutorial, tutorial mode before, but it was like an actual mode, where this is like, it shows you like a hype game, like it's overtime and like two cars are going and then like it pins to the car and all of a sudden it's like, press A to jump. And you're like, oh God, and you hit the button and it just automatically hits the ball. And so it kind of teaches you that. And once you go into the game, uh, a lot of the menus are now changed. The, the UI looks a lot more clean. The only issues that I've found so far is if you're playing on PC and you play with controller like I do, I started my first match. I jumped straight into competitive. I was like, I'm going to play some online ranked. Let's go. And then as soon as the game started, me and the other person playing on my team weren't moving. And I'm like, uh, what's going on here? What's going on here? And the other team smashes the ball and I get disconnected for inactivity. Uh, it turns out a little small fine print thing is with the new game update, you have to select a legacy mode for Steam for the controller to be able to activate this. I guess a Steam issue to activate the controller again. So I was able to, if I hit escape, I could navigate with the controller through the menus. Everything was great. But as soon as I went to try to play, I could not hit the gas. Nothing would work. So after learning that, thanks to uh, Oh God Brando, who was watching the stream at the time, kind of pointed it out to me, which was great because I actually figured it out. And uh, But other than that, the only other problem that I've seen that people are complaining about too is that the quick match option is now out. So when you start, if you're playing competitive and you try to start a new match, you literally have to go through like four menus of UI to like get to the point where you start a new match again. And uh, the quick play used to take care of that. You would just say queue up again and you just play the same mode you played the last game. Uh, so that's something I'm probably sure they're probably going to probably put that out in a new update. I'm sure that's going to change. But for now, that's what it is. But overall, UI looks great. Obviously, free to play is going to mean a lot more players, a lot more competition, and uh, it's going to be on Epic. So that's the news with the Rocket League. Uh, not quite as crazy, and but maybe unexpected, and certainly something that a lot of our listeners probably would never run into was that uh, ICBS, which got it's the internet arm of CBS which got bought out by Viacom and became Viacom CBS is deciding to tighten down 
what their core business is and they're selling off parts of it that they don't consider part of the core business anymore. So they're selling off CNET, which is you know a technology site that very many people are familiar with, of course. That site's still and, around. <laughs> yeah. That site has been around forever. Oh my god. Oh absolutely. It sure is. It hasn't gone anywhere. You they, still download things see, from there. It's crazy. Right? Yeah. And well, the download is a small part of it. I mean, they, they are a technology website. They do they do articles and everything. They do podcasts. Uh, Jeff Bacalar is on there, and he started doing some podcasts on CNET uh, where he has pinball machines being brought into his house. I think he's got like eight or – like he has different people bringing in pinball machines to his house, and he's live streaming and playing these pinball games. He's got like awesome. eight or ten of them right now. It's I insane. wish I was like that on that level where I could just do that. <laughs> yeah. all day <laughs> have these people deliver them to your house yeah and then just review them you know no big deal so they said that uh cnet media group has 980 employees and this is per the variety.com article that i'm reading here and they got the quote from the company that is purchasing it which is red ventures which is a marketing firm not another internet company, not another broadcast company or media company, a marketing firm. Red Ventures, they said, our plan is to grow CNET in ways unforeseen. Uh, Considering they're a marketing firm, I could see that be unforeseen because it's going to be really interesting to see what they do with this. My question is why? Why do we want to grow CNET? That's that's like the first thing that comes to my mind. Like, why are we still growing CNET? I don't know. They see something oh, they, they're, unforeseen. They're I guess. pretty good on reviews of different hardware and stuff. They they've got some nice reviews out there of computer hardware or different technology like cameras, cell phones, stuff like that. Yeah. They have some knowledgeable people on their staff. Forget Which would probably the download sense. part of it. I mean, you got to think they've lasted this long. I was going to say reason. that's that's a good point. Yeah, <clears throat> they've been around forever. There's, there's and, a lot of places out there that do similar things, but they they haven't been moved out. Yeah, exactly. Now, an interesting part of this and something that only certain people would be aware of is that there is a website, one of the largest gaming websites on the Internet, which is giantbomb.com. Uh, you can also get to them by going to nuke.com. <laughs> they uh, built up after several people left GameSpot back in the day, which is another extremely large right. gaming website, which is also under ICBS, but doesn't seem to be part of this. That's interesting. But Giant Bomb is being sold off to Red Ventures as well. So that was very interesting to find out. They have a close partnership all the time with GameSpot. So GameSpot, the game website, not GameStop, the physical brick and mortar right. store that's in danger. So that'll be interesting because I don't see anything about GameSpot being sold off to Red Ventures. So somebody went out right to Jeff.Zone because Jeff Gersman, the one of the co-creators of Giant Bomb, has his own like little side site that he just kind of messes around with. And they said, hey, uh, are you part of this? Is this going on? Is this affecting you? And he says, you probably know about as much as I do at this point. I mean, I just woke up to a bunch of meeting invites, some of which I'm going to and have to miss because I'm out for most of this week handling family things. Anyway, we're part of the sale in case there was any question around that. I'm tentatively excited, I guess I'd say. There's potential in this site that's never been realized, the site being Giant Bomb. And I think that some new owners might really be able to help us with that. Sounds like so he's more Daniel. excited than people leaving Mixer. <laughs> yeah, well, people leaving Mixer, A, didn't have a choice. Well, I know. <laughs> nor did he, but also didn't have anything good to go to. Yeah, that was crazy. So this is interesting news. It definitely got my attention and also was sent to us by our roving reporter, Tickle. Thanks, Tickle. Who also... Yeah, who also is a Giant Bomb fan like I am, so I can see why this got his attention or her attention. We don't know. Tickle is a person. They. And, yeah, it should be really interesting that seeing, you know, 
was a 15 ish years ago when Jeff Gershman left GameSpot under some interesting circumstances and started his own site and really built it up with, you know, the help of a lot of people and the co-creators and really kept some journalistic integrity, really kept some interesting viewpoints and understood the changing of the times where the idea was more video content, more content around personalities versus like just raw review facts. But, you know, so to the point where you could go to the site now and you can listen to them or listen to their podcast and you can say, oh, I really, I agree with this person on how they talk about this genre of games. So if I see them talking about a new game under that genre, I'm going to listen to them because then I'm going to have an informed opinion on whether I want to purchase it or not. Among other things. Plus, they tend to be funny, at least to me, but I'm an old man, so don't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other exciting news that we got is cyberpunk related. Not Wait, really. cyberpunk? That was, we already talked about cyberpunk. I what know, are you doing? and I don't want to use the, the, the bad bait and switch because that's what a lot of places yeah, like this is, to do. This, is, this was clickbaity when this you described it. This is super clickbaity, but no, actually, there's a new game coming out. It's called The Invincible. And it's actually made by the cyberpunk. Well, let's back it up. See, this is the clickbait part. These are developers that have worked on cyberpunk, on Dying Light, Witcher 3, and Dead Island. They all came from, you know, obviously CD Projekt Red and some others. But they, uh, they're making a new game called The Invincible. And they have a new label they're going to be putting this game out on, a new publisher. It's going to be Star Wars uh, Industries. And the game is apparently, apparently going to be available for PS5, Xbox Series X, and also PC. Uh, it's a sci-fi masterpiece is what they consider it. And so Star Wars Industries is going to make their production debut. This is an article from Essentially Sports, which is so funny because they're not really just, you know, Essentially Sports. Uh, make their debut, uh, The Invincible. The game's going to be part of a sci-fi genre. It will uh, feature a first-person, next-generation thriller story following the adventure of a scientist who's trying to find their lost crewmates on a hostile planet. So the the Steam page has already basically been updated and the... The, the, the description they have online so far is this landing on a planet Regis three. You have to find your missing crew members using some advanced space equipment whilst relying on your brains and instinct to survive on the planet with what quickly occurs to be over become over um, unwelcoming. Soon as you discover that Regis three holds terrifying secrets, which are uncovered while you're piecing together the fate of your crew. And as you delve deeper into the mystery, you realize that perhaps you're not alone and that some places on the planet are better left untouched but it's too late to turn back. So they uh, they have a lot of cool art so far for this that's posted, and I don't know if that's the way the game's going to look or if that's just the, the the concept drawings they have so far. But one thing that to note they did announce is that the game is going to be based on the Unreal 4 engine, so the developers promise a state-of-the-art graphics for this game. Yeah, um, my I'm glad that this is just the start of this because that means this isn't going to come out to like... 2022 or 2023 because yeah. my dance card is filled up for a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if it's going to be state of the art graphics, I mean, it looks like we're going to have to have a state of the art graphics card. Or will speaking we? of, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is uh, I've uh, been trying to purchase an NVIDIA um, RTX 3080. Like there are some problems right now. And by some, I mean a lot. So if you paid any attention to us talking about the PS4 pre or PS5, sorry, pre-order issues, well, this is worse. <laughs> this is worse on a whole other level. Imagine not setting up pre-orders at all and then having all of your inventory for all your manufacturers combined disappear within not even minutes, but in most cases, seconds. Um, and not to any real people for the most part. Um, NVIDIA did not give a perfectly clear time frame in any official way for the most part. Um, there was a um, post from somebody who was part of their community team that stated that the release was most likely going to be or was slated to be 6 a.m. Um, Pacific time. And that was supposed to be today. Um, that was also... Um, followed up by Newegg, who advised uh, on a similar time frame. However, some cards started trickling out for sale on Newegg itself, 
um, spanning from 2 o'clock in the morning through to 7.50 in the morning, which was weird. Um, and then at 9, when everything was supposed to go for sale, 9 Eastern, that is, um, when everything was supposed to go for sale, uh, NVIDIA's website immediately showed sold out. Best Buy nearly instantaneously showed sold out. Newegg also <laughs> nearly instantly showed sold out. Amazon never actually sold anything. They never showed that they were selling at all. Um, fast. I was, uh, I was present for this. I was, you know, I, I stayed up all night. I tried to get those, um, random releases through the middle of the night. I got them in my cart multiple times. Did not work. Um, essentially the entire release, uh, there was a, a very large scarcity in inventory. Um, and the more you read into it, the more you find out that um, NVIDIA announced that they had been making these cards and they had been in production um, since April or since August, I should say, which for some reason they thought saying since August made it sound like they had been in production a long time. They didn't specify when in August. So it could have <laughs> been as short as, you know, two and a half weeks worth of production, considering where we are right now, um, or as long as maybe about a month and a half. Um, Asus did not sell any cards. They were not prepared. They did not come out. They did not sell anything. Asus cards are not on sale. Um, I was able to get some information from someone at Newegg that was probably not supposed to divulge as much information as they did. Um, <laughs> but um, they did advise to me that the cards are, for the most part, sold out with the exception of return cards. And uh, they did indicate that uh, most manufacturers cards will not be back in stock until late September through to late October. Um, and they indicated that Zotac, one of the manufacturers does not have anything slated for delivery period as of this point in time, which I Breaking thought was news. Um, you heard it, the, first. <laughs> it is just a, a very large catastrophe in terms of selling. Um, Reddit is very angry. Uh, if you go to view any of the communication nvidia and their fan base it is not good right now there's um it's a lot of a lot of rage towards their release um, so, and they've been backpedaling a lot on things that has not been going well for them so it's been a very mixed bag all around um scalpers essentially purchased the majority of the cards within seconds of the launch and now they're being resold on ebay at marks ups anywhere from um double the price three times um, and they're selling very well in between the 1300 to $2,000 range. Uh, what about uh, for, seven, for a $700 bots. card for a $700 card? So what about bots though? You said scalpers but I, I thought there was a thing about bots. So essentially uh, the scalpers are kind of go hand in hand with the bots. Um, there was a group that actually came forward almost to taunt NVIDIA um, announcing that they as a team provided bot services to scalpers in order for them to mass purchase um, games. And reportedly, based on a snippet from the bot they released, um, for at least the NVIDIA website, NVIDIA's sale API, their store API is open to their communication. So they were able to integrate with it and automatically send purchases without having to deal with the actual store screen and purchase their Founders Edition cards mass, um, making their website instantly sell out. Um, first it crashed, and then at 5.10 they went live with their sales, 5.10 p.m. Eastern, and they sold out um, near instantaneously. Newegg claims that they have um, bot, uh, like anti-bot measures put in place, which the botters themselves responded by saying, no, you don't. Here's the proof. <laughs> Um, and people responded by going and also finding the eBay posts, linking um, their certification, saying, look, these people have these cards and they're proving it by saying, look at this order form for 14 plus cards all purchased on Newegg. Um, even though there was a limit of one card per person, it was one card per manufacturer or model type, um, meaning that you could purchase one of each model type in the same card. And cash out. At one point, I actually tried to do the same for three <laughs> cards. I was willing to drop $2,500 in order to get myself and two friends the cards and they could just reimburse me later. But they were sold out within the three seconds it took me to hit my one click payment checkout. I was not one of the two friends, just FYI. <laughs> yeah. Or was I? 
I hate to laugh at this because <laughs> yeah, I hate scalpers so much. Yeah. I, I, and, and I, and it's this, it's going to be the PlayStation stuff, uh, causing an artificial scarcity of, of PlayStation, maybe the Xbox too. We don't know yet. And you know, it's PAX tickets back in the past. Yeah. Uh, I'd see I mean, scalpers all the tickets. time at PAX. Uh, anything, yeah, anything all kinds. that people can resell that needs some sort of supply and demand, they're going to do it. I mean, I have a friend, love him to death, but he does the same thing. He'll buy new consoles. He'll buy special release, uh, excuse me, records or whatever, just to be able to resell one of the copies online. And I really hate it. That's, it sucks, but it is part it's of the way. It's kind of different if you buy two and you're kind of recouping your costs by like selling this other one because you know a lot of people are going to be interested in it. As long as you're not like outrageously price gouging. You know, mark it up a little bit to like recoup some of your costs. But these people that buy 10 and 15 and 20 and 100, right. and, you know, a thousand well, of these things and they're doubling and tripling, quadrupling the price. And it's well, like recently, it's not over yet. Yeah. I mean, the 3090s are coming soon. Right. Um, they're just yeah. one week away. And or according are they? to Newegg reps, they're also not currently in stock they don't have them yet they haven't received them now i mean they still have you know six days to to get that in stock and ready to go but um that's the question is um for one asus has not released their 3080s yet and it looks like shipments for asus cards will not release until the 25th of september which is unusual because asus is one of the two largest manufacturers alongside evga which usually have um anywhere from four to six models upon card release and they're they're just not present. They're not there. I mean, Amazon as a retailer isn't even selling any right now. Um, so, with the 3090s just around the corner, will will those exist? If if Asus is just pushing out their 3080s next week, will will Asus 3090s, which are one of the most sought after ones, the Asus ROG Strix 3090s, are those going to be there? And even if they are, are the bots just going to pick those up and mark them <laughs> up from fifteen to seventeen hundred dollars to you know, 3,000. Um, yeah. I'm glad I'm not sure. going to rebuild the computer until next year. I mean, that's point. the thing. I, I wanted to get a 3080, but like it wasn't a necessity. And at this point, it sounds like I'm definitely not going to get one. I'm definitely not going to have one for a while. I mean, just literally picking up this <laughs> microphone, which is the HyperX uh, microphone they have. It's USB or whatever. And just getting this, I went to Micro Center and I've been watching this specific microphone for three months. Three months I've been checked. I checked every online retailer. So because obviously COVID, I wasn't going to the stores. I was online on Amazon. I was online on Best Buy. I was checking out Micro Center, even their website where all the different uh, office uh, depot apparently carries us or something. I don't know. And uh, so I was checking all these websites. And finally, the day that it came available, like I refreshed the page and it said it was still in stock at Micro Center. I was like, what? So I clicked the button. I bought one and I went into the store, mask on, ready to like fight anybody that got close to me. And as I'm waiting in line, which they actually did a good job, they had like everything roped off and it was like really limited people going inside the store. I was actually pretty impressed on that and uh, in the face shields and all that stuff. But uh, as I'm waiting in line to get to the person to talk to, I hear another lady at the counter and she's like, uh, the guy's like, uh, so what are you here for? Uh, she's like, I'm picking up an order. And he's like, what did you order? And she goes, I got four HyperX uh, microphones. And I'm like, I kind of like cut over because I, I heard HyperX. I'm like, well, I got one of those. And then she's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, I said something out loud. And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah. I've been watching them for like months now. You know, me and my friends need them. And I'm like, but do you really like four? Do you really need four? <laughs> like, like, what, does she have her own podcast? Maybe she does. I don't know. But I was just, I was just like, really? But like, those are the kind of people I just like, I really just can't stand. Like, come on, man. Give people a chance to run economy. Yeah. Give people a chance to, to buy one at a normal price. Well, what about some good news? Uh, not really. <laughs> no, but no. Uh, Seriously, I know we'll, we'll have some good news later. But so we talked about music before, and we talked about the Rona economy, and we talked about how live streaming performances has become a thing. We talked about, or I talked about personally, uh, between the Buried Me's, one of the bands that I'm into, uh, they played in front of eight thousand people when they were really only playing for a couple thousand, maybe at, at a certain venue. And, you know, that's been become a really big thing that a lot of people are starting to do now. Like a lot of bands are trying to to get themselves out there, get their name. That's what we talked about before. Get their name out there, because why not? You know, well, Facebook has different feelings towards this. 
So Facebook actually came out and said, uh, well, well, they didn't really come out and say this, but they did with their, their new terms of service. So effective October 1, this is an actual article from Loudwire. Uh, Facebook is taking steps to limit the ability of bands to promote videos that will create a music listening experience for yourself or for others. So that sounds kind of ambiguous. You're kind of like, I don't really know what that means. That can mean anything. Well, if you actually read the rules, it says this. You may not use videos on our products to create a music listening experience. What? <laughs> so we want you to be able to enjoy videos posted by friends and family. However, if you use videos on our products to create a music listening experience for yourself or for others, your videos will be blocked and your page profile or group may be deleted. This includes live. I'm confused. Haven't we in the past talked about how Facebook is now the number two or number three largest streaming service? That's correct. Wouldn't they want to encourage this? You would think that. And actually, you know, with this announcement, you're you're kind of backpedaling. You're like, oh, God, well, what do I do? But I think you have something else to share, don't you? Mine seems a little bit better, which is that when you are streaming the game you're playing, because apparently you can't stream your band playing songs. Originals. But at least <laughs> original songs in, in your own songs. But now Facebook Gaming uh, will allow you to use copyrighted music in your streams. So instead of getting blocked or DMC takedown, right. or in some cases, they just silence the part of the stream on some services. Facebook gaming actually will allow it. According to the verge, when they were talking to Facebook gaming, they put it, uh, Facebook gaming, put it like this music played during a gaming broadcast must be a background element, not a primary focus. It kind of ties back into what you were saying, Mike, because yeah. <laughs> the band is life's, you know, the primary focus uh, when you do it a live concert. Uh, but it needs, needs to be not the primary focus of the stream. For example, a streamer's voice and or gameplay audio should be in the foreground. This also applies to clips made from a live stream and the VOD version of live streams, but does not extend separately uh, to separately edited and or uploaded video on demand content. Now, it's not every piece of copyrighted mu music. It's whoever they've made licensing deals with. Right. So they actually have a list of what you can do. So it's not everything. You got to be careful about that. Which so at I, least it's a. Well, I'll say I will say ahead of Twitch. That's kind of better because on Twitch, there's really not mm -hmm. any sort of licensing deal. And I will say they've gotten better at it. They've actually made a, hu a whole music se uh, section dedicated for this on Twitch now where you can, as a musician, you can sponsor yourself to be license free mm -hmm. and like use your music on like on uh, streams and stuff. And they actually have Spotify integrated too, to where they have actual playlists that you can play those that all the songs on this playlist are essentially like uh, cleared. Royalty free. Play. And uh, yeah. so like with pretzel, we use pretzel, which is uh, another open mm -hmm. uh, game like that. But it's it's also, you know, with pretzel, they have advertisements that spawn our chat, which is fine because, I mean, we're not paying for it. Right. But so but that's only it because Twitch won't let us. Yeah. Help support the artists. And we can't do this legally through Twitch. So we can't play Spotify. We can't have our own music playing. So at least Facebook seems like they're trying to take one step in the right direction. But at the same time, they're trying to block other live artists like. Well, and the other weird thing about this is that they say that the music can't be the main focus. Yeah. And they say, for example, streamer voice or gameplay audio should be in the foreground. But what if your gameplay is <laughs> rock band <laughs> beat or, <saber. laughs> or a great example that has personally happened to me is one finger death punch. One Finger Death Punch has some great music in it. And it's not music you would recognize as being you know, like pop music or anything like that. But that person that created that music has put their music into whatever database that checks for it. And I've had multiple videos that have been DMC takedown because all I was doing was playing a game. 
that yeah. had this music in the background. And yeah. it said, nope, you can't you can't monetize this at all. And I'm like, well, then I'm never playing that game on stream again because uh, that that's useless to me. Yeah, and it's hurting you. It's hurting the artist. It's hurting. And it's not even that you're it's hurting them in the sense of like taking money away from them. Right. It's literally like you're hurting everyone because like you're taking stuff down that doesn't really matter. Like they've already cleared. Like, I don't know. This makes no sense. Yeah. Clearly, a lot of these people are falling down on the job with trying to make something that is going to work with everyone and still respect the artist's rights. Yeah. So there's just a lot of overstep in the situation for. Yeah. And it's just different depending on which streaming service is doing it because nobody quite knows how to approach it and everyone thinks they're approaching it the best way. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of streamers who you can go on Twitch right now, the home front page and select probably 10 of the 20 that you select will probably be playing Spotify in the background of just artists that you know, songs you know. And guess what? There's no royalties being paid for that. That's just what it is. So, yeah. I mean, it's 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 a weird battle and it's a weird way that they're ruling this out for these two t- like scenarios that it's to this. I don't know. Weird. Anyway, yeah. for a nice story, a good story, let's talk about yeah. Fall Guys. So, uh, Fall Guys. Um, you know, there's, we've had some examples of missteps from different companies, and uh, I mentioned community managers from uh, from NVIDIA and, and Newegg putting out things they probably shouldn't have said that they had to backpedal, but there's always those examples of community managers that do things right, and they kind of hit it correctly with their... Uh, with their fan base, and this is just a really good example. Um, uh, a generic-ish internet troll did uh, the good old adding um, the essentially Fall Guys hashtag Fall Guys Dead Game on Twitter just to kind of give give a dig at them. And uh, <laughs> the Fall Guys community manager um, blocked that person. Um, with kind of a, a bit of a quip just to kind of kind of take a dig at them. And uh, the response back was uh, the person asked the Fall Guys community manager if they could be unbanned or unblocked, I should say. And the community manager responded that um, they would be unblocked if they were willing to write on a piece of paper 24 lines of Fall Guys is not actually a dead game, and I like to see their... T- uh, <laughs> that is fantastic. Sure enough, the wow. user obliged and handwritten on gridded paper wrote the 24 lines of Fall Guys is not actually a dead game. And I like to see their tweet. So um, it's like a really nice thing. You know, there's, there's a lot of bad interactions right now with um, either you know, PC hardware providers or console providers or just um, in general, a lot of different game companies just really missing the mark and not understanding their communities. And it seems like time over time, at the very least, the the people who manage the community for Fall Guys are really, really knocking it out of the park. So there's there's still some hope out there for companies that really understand their fan base and what they're doing. It's just like a, a great little example of it. Yeah, I mean, even with that said, I mean, it would be totally understandable if somebody blocked someone from, you know, being able to reply to tweets that was a troll, which seemed like the case here. And then just went on with the rest of their day and not cared because I mean, that's, that's pretty normal on Twitter. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So this was a really interesting and innovative way to, you know, kind of continue for it. Maybe even turn that troll around to a fan. So, What's also interesting is Fall Guys, I don't know if you guys knew, but they actually have FBI agents working for them. Okay, this is a joke, but the next story will make sense. So they had actually posted on Monday on their Twitter on September 14th. This is a Twitter thread that you can literally go to their Twitter right now and read. And it and it's, and it's so long, I'm not going to go through all of it. But the initial post was this. It says, I've got a lot of spicy content for you this week. The dev team have been super busy on the new updates. Everybody's like excited. But it says, for now, buckle up. Let me tell you a wild story. It's called The Rise and Fall of Cheater Island. And it says, tagging Netflix in case they want to make a film or series out of it. And, okay. and the next post goes into it. It says, at launch, we had some of our own cheat detection built into the game. We weren't baiting anyone <laughs> at this point. 
just gathering data carefully. We wanted to be 100% sure that our cheat detection would only catch people if they were legitimately uh, cheating, so no false flags. I may have to read this whole thing. I don't know. After we confirmed that it was working, we secretly launched Fall Guys Cheater Island. It was a magical place where cheaters could happily compete against each other and for their own cheater's crown. And then asterisk, literally just a normal crown, but tainted with the hollow feeling of guilt and regret. Remembering at this point, we had data on who was cheating, but we weren't acting on it. So Fall Guys Cheater Island had a population of zero. So very carefully over time, we started lowering the threshold on the cheat detection. If you pass the threshold, you were tagged as a cheater. It's worth pointing out at this stage, cheaters are very smart. So if they known they'd been tagged as a cheater, they would work it out because they knew they were tagged and they would tell other cheaters. So our threshold was originally really tolerant. Cheaters would get caught, but no, but not insta banished. We hoped that we might realize cheating kills the fun. Most continued. We wanted people to have fun, but not the expertise of others. So we kept lowering the threshold. So if you were tagged as a cheater, you'd be able to finish the game you were in, but the next time you tried to match make, you would only be able to match make with other cheaters without realizing you were there. You made it, queuing for Cheater Island. Now imagine this, imagine if you can. You need 40 plus players to actually populate a game. Cheater Island isn't a location in the real world. Cheater Island had its own set, uh, had its own set of global servers. You'd, you'd need enough cheaters in the region in order to start a Cheater Island game. If there were enough cheaters, you'd be able, you'd be falling, you'd just be falling forever. So there were a few genuine bugs with that would be caused sim- uh, similar to this. Things would happen, but mostly when people said they were just falling forever, they were cheaters. We didn't want to give them any extra info. So I'm sure you've noticed we try to be super open and upfront with all of our communications. It's been very difficult to talk about cheaters though, because everyone we say, uh, everything we say, gives the cheaters more ammo. So they were using any info to improve their cheating. So for a long time, there weren't enough cheaters to actually start these matches. So as we lowered the threshold on our detection, more and more cheaters were getting caught. But still, no Cheater Island matches. Cheaters were falling forever and saying the game was broken. Now, back out of this, how many times did we feel like we were falling forever? And like, I mean, but things were happening behind the scenes that we didn't even know about. We were just playing and we had no idea. And, you know, they were you know comparing algorithms or whatever. So anyway, back to it. At this point, cheaters started to realize they could team up with friends who weren't cheaters and they could match make with them. They were escaping our cheater island. Oh, no. We raced to patch this before they all realized. Cheaters also realized they could use family sharing to share the game to another account. And then with the other account, bypass cheater island. So we disabled family sharing to fix this problem. Dealing with cheaters is difficult. They're honestly very crafty. During all this time, we kept increasing the threshold on our cheat detection. We were 100% confident that anyone being flagged as a cheater was definitely a cheater or definitely cheating. This was super important to us. We didn't want to make any, we didn't want to falsely ban anyone. So last week, something exciting happened. So this was actually last week. There were finally enough cheaters to actually match make and create cheaters island matches. Here's a new problem though. People were uploading videos that we think are cheater island. Somebody actually uploaded a video on Reddit with the title, ever played around a fall mountain where all the players are cheating? The problem is this looks like Cheaters Island, but we can't be 100% sure. So here's another video, another video on their Twitter. It says, uh, the person isn't recording isn't cheating. Either they didn't cheat just for the video or it's a genuine server and it's a legit player. Either way, it makes the game look bad. So we do know that Cheater Island matches were happening. We just don't know if there was actually, if these were from those videos from that. For that reason, we have closed down Cheater Island. Instead, cheaters are now unable to log in, and we're continuously improving the threshold on our cheat detection too. So our cheat detection system was good, but we hadn't expected so many players, and we had no idea the length uh, that some players would go through to cheat. So we tried to create a system around honesty, but as soon as we realized we were in an arms race, we called up the experts at Epic. And our next update is called Big Yeetus, which we talked about before, the Big Yeetus Hammer. Big Yeetus and the Anti-Cheetus. I'll tell you more about the Yeetus part later, but the Anti-Cheetus part, we're actually adding Epic's Anti-Cheat, which will be a huge step forward for us improving things coming soon. But I realize it's an insanely long thread, but the story of the Cheater Island and the reason behind why we've been so cryptic and so vague. So I know that was long-winded, but damn, wasn't that great. Like, <laughs> literally trolling the trolls and then still, you know, making the game better. Like, I think that's a great story to end on because, man, 
Like we don't see that, like you said earlier, Bruno, like you don't see developers interacting and actually taking the initiative to understand what the, the fans want or what they're saying and and how to really just come across at a normal like rate as a normal person, like a normal company. And uh, it's great really to see. really don't anymore. It's yeah. changed. It's really great changed to see. a lot. That. So with that being said, that is the end of our short segments. So this is typically we go into emails. Uh, still, inbox is empty. We would love to see an email or two from anyone about, you know, how you feel, whatever, anything you want to talk about. It's totally fine. We have no problems with that. We'll read it out loud. Uh, but in case you haven't, and if you don't know what the email is, the email is goa at sasgaming.com. So that's goa at sasgaming.com. And uh, so that's what got our attention this week. If you're listening to the podcast, you can obviously check us out here live on the Twitch. Uh, our Twitch has actually changed recently as of today. It's uh, now twitch.tv slash SAS gamers. So S-A-S-S-G-A-M-E-R-S. Uh, same as our Twitter, same as our Instagram, same handle. Uh, and we'll be here at the same time, 9 p.m. To, to however long it takes us to do that. Uh, but if you like what you hear... Uh Thanks for everybody who made the switch and uh, came over tonight and uh, is watching us live. Yeah, for sure. And uh, obviously, if you, if you like what you hear, you can follow us on. We all individually have different Twitches, which we'll go through in a second. Uh, but we all have, you know, SAS Gaming has Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, uh, all of that fun stuff. So if uh, if you're if you're interested in listening and trying to follow uh, my information, so my handle is Zycia. So it's XYCIA on Twitch. On uh, Twitter, it's Zycia, XYCIA Gaming. And then on Instagram, it's also Zycia Gaming as well. Uh, so Brian has his own. Now mine's uh, fairly uh, straightforward. It's Phoenix Nova, except with a double N in Phoenix. So P-H-O-E-N-N-I-X Nova. Uh, that's, you know, at Phoenix Nova for Twitter. And Twitch, it just has an underscore in between the Phoenix and the Nova. And Bruno. Yeah, and uh, mine's just Dimirn. It's D-Y-M-Y-R-N for Twitch TV and then my Twitter handle is right <laughs> there. There we go. That's D Y M Y R N game. Sweet. <clears throat> so if you guys liked what you heard, hopefully uh, we'll hear some feedback and you know, obviously if not, if you guys are still listening, we we appreciate it. And I know it's a hard time right now. Everything is wild in the world and we just don't know what's going to happen next, but at least if you can stay positive, you know, talk to your friends and family. Wear a mask, be safe, and until next time, we'll talk to you soon. See you later, everyone. Have a good night. Take care. Peace.